would like to welcome you to our 20th annual Veterans Day ceremony. We would like to acknowledge and thank the university for its commitment to hire veterans like myself and many of you out in the audience today. The positions held by veterans include trades, uh, skilled trades, managers, lecturers, postdocs, among others. Rice currently employs over 100 veterans and we continue our recruiting efforts to bring more veterans to our university. Before we begin our ceremony this morning, I would like to call your attention to the small table next to the stage. This table is set as a symbol for us to recognize and remember our POWs and our MIAs. The table consists of the following elements. A small table set for one, symbolizing the isolation of the absent service member. Remember. A white tablecloth to symbolize the pure intentions of the service member who responded to the country's call to arms. Remember. A single rose in the vase symbolizing the blood that the service members have shed and sacrificed to ensure the freedom of the United States of America. Remember. The yellow ribbon represents the family and friends who have kept the faith while awaiting the return of our missing service members. Remember. A slice of lemon on the bread, or on a bread plate that represents the bitter fate of the missing. Remember. The salt sprinkled on the bread plate that symbolizes the tears shed by the waiting families. Remember. An inverted glass to represent the fact that the missing have fallen and cannot partake in our celebration. Remember. A candle symbolizes a light of hope and the lives in the hearts to eliminate the missing's way home. Remember. And an empty chair to represent the absence of the missing and the fallen. Remember. Please take a moment after the ceremony and stop by the table to pay your respects. Thank you. Um, it is an honor to stand in front of you today, not only as a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, but as a mother of an active duty Marine as well, stationed overseas. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's quite different being the parent rather than the active duty member. Um, but. It's, uh, it's an honor, um, but I would like to begin our ceremony and I'd like to ask everyone to rise in honor of the national anthem that's gonna be sung by Stephanie Shi, a graduate student in the Shepherd School of Music.
Um, I'd like to introduce Lauren Cassidy from the Environmental Health and Safety to the stage. He will introduce our keynote speaker, Nick, to the podium. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lauren Cassidy. I am with the Environmental Health and Safety, and I'm also from the United States Army 82nd Airborne Division. But I'm here today, I want to introduce to you a good friend of mine. Lieutenant Colonel Nick Sammons is an MQ-9 Reaper Evaluator Pilot, an RC-26B Pilot and Director of Maintenance for the 147th Operations Group, 147th Attack Wing, Texas Air National Guard, and Ellington Air Base. The Lieutenant Colonel received his commission and the Air Force through the United States Air Force Academy in 2002. In 2004, he completed specialized undergraduate pilot training at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. He was assigned to the 10th Aircraft, I'm sorry, the 10th Airlift Squadron located in McCord Air Force Base, Washington from July 2004 until to December of 2008. Colonel Sammons has separated from active duty in 2014 and joined the Texas Air National Guard Ellington Airfield. He is a command pilot with more than 5,000 hours in the T-37, T-1A, C-17A, MQ-1B, MQ-9, and RC-26B. He can fly. He is also a savvy poker player and enjoys my scotch. It, it is my privilege and honor to ask Lieutenant Colonel Nick Sammons to the podium, please. Thank you. Well, good morning, Rice family. How's everyone doing this morning? What a fabulous day for us to gather and uh, pay tribute to, uh, to this special day that is Veterans Day. We're, we're nearing 104 years, right? So on the 11th hour of the 11th day, of the 11th month, back in 1918, Armistice Day was formed. And then in 1954, we changed it to what we now call Veterans Day. So it's just an absolute honor to be standing before you. Uh, I don't know who Cass is speaking about. That guy sounds uh, awesome. I'd like to meet him. So thanks for that. And uh, yes, I do enjoy your scotch. So thanks, brother. Thanks for having me here. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure why it's me standing up here at all. Um, there are so many others in this audience that have done so much more for our country and have so much more to tell. But uh, regardless, uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be before you. Like, like many that wear the uniform, uh, most likely we, we were instilled with a certain sense of duty. Maybe we have a lineage uh, of service in our, in our families. And that's, uh, that's really where I tie my decision to serve from. Um, my grandfather served in World War II as a combat engineer at D-Day in the Battle of Bulge with the 8th Corps. My uh, father and mother both served in the Air Force, and that's, uh, that's where they met. I, I married into the Air Force. My wife served for eight years, and uh, I have many aunts, uncles, and brother-in-laws that make up the, the nucleus within my extended family that kind of understand what it means to serve. And we're a small part of the nearly 18 million service members that we call veterans that walk amongst us every day. So 18 million. So it's about 5% of our population that wear that, that badge of veteran. Looking uh, into the, the, the census of 2020 just a little bit, and you can find that of those 18 million, about 75% are considered combat veterans. That's a lot. And then you pull that onion back just a little bit more, and you see that going back to 1973, when we moved from a draft system to an all-volunteer force, I, th I, would, I would posit that the majority of those that served were volunteers and are combat veterans, which is a pretty impressive thing to consider. Now, it, on Veterans Day and many times throughout the year, uh, I think most of us hear the, the phrase, if you meet a stranger in a store or a family member says, uh, thank you for your service. And at first, you know, I really didn't know what to make of that phrase because it's almost like that, almost like awkward for me to hear that. Like, thank you. well, it's all I've done since I was 18. So it's telling, thank you for just being you. I'm like, all right, uh, thank you. But I, I think if you 
take an honest moment to stand back and reflect on, on what that means. When someone says, thank you for your service, what does it mean to serve? Uh, which is what I, I challenged myself to do b before today. And I came up with a, with a few uh, qualifiers, some, some attributes that I think tie most, if not all of us, veterans together. The, the first is uh, sacrifice. Um, those that served understand the deployments, TDYs, missed birthdays, holidays, anniversaries, lots of moves, uprooting yourselves and planning yourself somewhere new. And uh, there's an adage, right, where they say, if you want to have a family in the military and have kids, you can either be there for the conception or the birth. You get to choose. So regarding sacrifice, and again, there, there are many stories to come, that, that come to mind. Uh, one, one for me that, for, for whatever reason, hit home was uh, a long time ago when my now 12-year-old had just turned one. I, I, I was on a deployment. Um, I was part of Air Force Special Operations, and, and I was overseas, and I missed his first birthday. And at the time, technology wasn't what it is today. And so I was, I was afforded the ability to, to, to whatever it was, it was Skype. I, I can't remember what the platform was, but, but once a week for just a few minutes was all we were afforded. And so my son, at an impressionable age, would see dad on the screen and get to chat for a few minutes. And so the moment comes, you come home, and you knock on the door, and my wife opens up the door, and you get down on that knee, and you're waiting for your son to come give me a big hug. And mom says, there's daddy. And my one-year-old goes, no, not daddy, and runs into the living room and points up to a picture of me. It says, daddy, that daddy thinking, you know, daddy is like flat Stanley and not a, not, not a real individual. You know, I, I take that as a sacrifice that my family had to endure. One of many, I know one of many that, that our audience here has, has to endure as well. Another one is that of resilience. To be able to, to carry on in, in the face of adversity. Uh, again, lots of stories to share here, but, but this one, I want to share about my brother Cass. So for those that don't know, a few years ago, he was diagnosed with, with cancer. Uh, and and as, a, as, a, as a friend, when you get that news, you know, it's just that, that solemn moment of, oh man, are you okay? You, you doing okay? And I tell you what, from, from day one through the time when he rung the bell right down the road, his attitude and the way he attacked this problem was just impressive to me, and I've told him this many times. And it's something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And no matter what life throws at you, resilience is the ability to fight through mentally and overcome that problem. It was just impressive, brother. Another word that came to mind was fortitude. That's uh, courage in pain or adversity. It's similar to resilience, but it's a little different. Uh, Again, within uh, the, the, the special operations community, one time I was flying armed overwatch uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the heights of the, of the Hellman move in Afghanistan, and uh, our special operators were doing uh, clearing after clearing, night after night, where you go in, they, they build up a, a strike package, you go in, you're searching for a high-value individual, and they go into the building really not knowing what's going to happen, and then they, they, they do their thing, and they, they, they come out, and it's, it is, and it's uh, repetitive, and it's brutal. But we're, we're there, we're getting the mission done. But every once in a while, despite the best planning, the best intelligence, and the best uh, efforts, uh, sometimes on the radio you still hear the words, eagle down. That means one of the good guys was injured or killed. Sometimes it was the latter, not always the former. And the next night, same team, same mission, you see them on the screen. You're there for them, and I know what burden they're carrying, but they're still getting on after the mission. To me, that speaks of fortitude. If they're able to, to pick themselves up and then continue on with the mission, maybe I can too. Maybe I can too. Some other attributes that came to mind, I think serving in our forces brings is loyalty, camaraderie, resolve, and perhaps a bit of dark humor. I think it's all kind of baked into us. The bottom line is that we're a profession of arms where we all have taken an oath. We all took an oath to support and defend the Constitution, an idea that began 233 years ago. 
we were the guardians at the gate. We were the ones our country entrusted to protect and defend. What I would challenge each of you to do, if you served, is when you hear those words, and it's not an if anymore, when you hear those words, thank you for your service. Take a moment and reflect on what that means to you. Rice family, it's been an absolute honor to be able to stand up here in front of you today, and thank you for this wonderful Veterans Day program. Thank you. Okay, I would now like to introduce, oh, hold on. I would like to introduce Kenneth Jackson. Ken Jackson is a graduate student in the class of 2023 at the Jones Graduate School of Business and the co-president of the business or the Rice Business Veterans Association. That's the new name, right? Yes. Okay. Before coming to Rice, Ken graduated from the United States Military Academy in 2013 and completed eight years of active duty service as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot in the United States Army. Ken began his military career with the 1st Armored Division Combat Aviation Brit Ooh, this is a big one. Okay, here's a mouthful. Um, the Black Hawk helicopter pilot in the United States Army, he began his career the 1st Armored Division Combat Aviation Brigade in Fort Bliss, Texas, where he supported Operation Atlantic Resolve as a flight platoon leader in Turkey, Lat Latva, La Ooh, okay, and Germany. And in August 2017, Ken commanded a flight detachment to Houston, Texas, as part of the U.S. Army Northern Commander Command's disaster relief efforts during Hurricane Harvey. Then he joined the first air, the first air cavalry. Oh man, this is a big one. Okay, first air cavalry brigade in Fort Hood, Texas, where he supported Operation Inherit Resolve in Iraq and Syria as a company commander. As a student at Rice Business, Ken is a member of the student-run investment committee known as the MA Wright Fund, as well as the Finance Association, the Entrepreneurship Association, and he is a co-chair for the 2023 Veterans Business Battle Pitch Competition. I'd like to honor Ken, Ken to the stage. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. I know it's uh, quite a mouthful with some of those units. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I personally want to thank every veteran here today for their service, as well as every non-veteran for showing their gratitude and support by attending today's ceremony. I'm honored to speak here today and represent the 55 veteran and active duty students currently at Rice Business School across the full-time, professional, executive, and online programs. Every one of the veteran students at Rice Business has a truly remarkable background with incredible stories to share. We may use our own jargon and lingo or disagree about which branch is the best, but we all have one thing in common. We were all able to agree that as a helicopter pilot, I had the best job in the military. <laughs> now, I'm joking, obviously, but I am going to use my time up here to tell a story about flying. Flying helicopters is incredible, but learning to fly them is not always so enjoyable. You start by doing simple traffic patterns, which is just taking off, flying a lap around the runway, and then landing. Sounds simple enough in practice, but becomes much more difficult when you realize that making one input uh, causes the other two to move as well. Until you get a feel for it, flying a helicopter is nothing more than an exhausting balancing act in an environment you don't understand and cannot control. Oddly enough, that description also applies to business school. <laughs> During my second day of flight school, I was struggling to make my way around the traffic pattern. I'm darting my eyes between the different indicators, trying to hold constant my airspeed, attitude, heading, vertical speed, and trim. Every attempted correction I make to one variable causes dramatic shifts in the others. I'm feeling overwhelmed as I turn final for landing when all of a sudden, I feel my instructor pilot roll the engine throttle to idle, meaning that the engine is no longer supplying power to the rotor system. All of my previous concerns immediately left my mind, and I turned and stared at him like a deer in headlights. It felt like an eternity to me, but after a few seconds of silence, he stares back at me and asks a question I will never forget. As we are falling out of the sky, I'm expecting his thousands of flight hours to somehow solve this problem I'm facing. Yet in all of his profound wisdom, he simply asks, well, are you gonna do something or not? That question was enough to make me realize that this was my problem to solve, 
and doing nothing was not a very good option. Thankfully, I remembered the emergency procedure for loss of engine power, and with a little help from my instructor pilot, successfully landed my first auto rotation. I tell this story because that simple question of are you going to do something or not may not have been the help I was looking for, but it, it did communicate to me that I was responsible for both my actions and my inactions. That question when applied to life can be more revealing than anything else. How one answers it separates leaders from followers and performers from idlers. As I reflect on the thousands or millions of veterans we are recognizing and remembering today, I find it remarkable that every single one of them was faced with that question and deliberately chose action. From the moment someone feels the call of duty upon their heart and answers it by raising their right hand and swearing an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, they are choosing to be a person of action. They are choosing to take on the complex issues of global foreign policy, military strategy, and national defense. The call to action becomes embedded within veterans by that first act of raising their right hand. That is why before ever meeting my veteran cohort at Rice Business, I knew each and every one of them would be a problem solver and a leader. I knew that they would possess loyalty, a sense of duty, respect, and personal courage. No matter the obstacle, no matter the degree of difficulty, I know that I can trust my veteran classmates to act, to persevere, and to succeed. I believe this is the fundamental aspect underlying our armed forces that makes the United States military the most lethal fighting force in the world. But I'm also here representing the Jones Graduate School of Business. And I can tell you that it's not just veterans that possess these personality traits. Rice Business prides itself on entrepreneurship and has been ranked the number one entrepreneurship program in the nation by the Princeton Review for the last three years. This entrepreneurial mindset spills over into every aspect of the curriculum at Rice Business. Even at our beloved partios that are intended for socialization, students discuss challenging global issues and potential innovative solutions to solving them. At the heart of entrepreneurship is action. And when you ask an entrepreneur, are you going to do something or not? They answer with an affirmative yes. Rice Business has carefully crafted this culture that makes it such an attractive environment to transitioning veterans. It is well understood that leaving the military is challenging. There are too many demoralizing statistics proving this point. Some people choose to ignore it, but others take action. This Veterans Day, I want to thank Rice University for being a university of action. When faced with the decision of whether or not to do something to help veterans, Rice University answered the call by becoming a 100% yellow ribbon school, making higher education more accessible and more affordable to veterans and their family members. Furthermore, the Jones School intentionally became a business school that wanted to attract veterans. They made that commitment in 2013 by creating the Military Scholars Program and by forming the Rice Business Veterans Association. Since that time, Rice Business has helped over 200 veterans successfully uh, I'm sorry, transition, transition careers and is nationally recognized as one of the top veteran business schools in the country. In closing today, I wanted to bring us back to recognizing all veterans for their actions and thanking them for the freedom that we enjoy. Everyone in this audience is familiar with John F. Kennedy's call to action on September 12, 1962. We're in that stadium over there. He chose for the United States to go to the moon. Well, only three months before that speech, he addressed the graduating class of 1962 at the United States Military Academy. He was speaking to a class where many would be among the first U.S. troops to deploy and fight in Vietnam. He said, you and I leave here today to meet our separate responsibilities, to protect our nation's vital interests by peaceful means if possible, but by resolute action if necessary. We go forth confident of success because we know that we are working and fighting for each other and for all those men and women all over the globe who are determined to be free. Thank you. Okay, I'd like, ooh. I would now like to introduce a midshipman, Joseph Paki. He is a junior in chemical engineering and a midshipman platoon commander at the Rice Naval ROTC unit.
Thank you, ma'am. A few years ago, I was visiting the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. A section of the memorial displaying rows upon rows of small golden stars caught my eye, and I walked over to read the inscription. Each star, it said, represented 7,000 service members who had perished in the Pacific Theater. It was at that moment that the magnitude of the sacrifices made for our country, both past and present, began to gain true meaning in my mind. Growing up, I'd always been taught that service members fought to protect us and that we should always thank veterans for their service. But the reality of their service, up until that point, always seemed remote and abstract to me. Now, as I stood there and took the time to think about all of those people, most of them no older than myself, and the lives and the loved ones they had left behind forever, it all started to feel more real. And it should feel real. The reality of service is all around us. Many in the audience today have served their country in the armed forces. Still more have friends, family, and loved ones who have served. However many veterans you think you may know, you probably know even more. All around us are countless, otherwise ordinary Americans who at one point in their lives have answered the call to protect our country both in the mortal danger of combat and the monotony of maintenance and watches. From 1775 onwards to the present, our servicemen and women have made countless sacrifices for the United States and its people. All throughout our history, they have served in trenches, jungles, deserts, forests, and mountains. They have served submerged below ice caps, in the air, on the sea, in cockpits, bunkers, tank hulls, engine rooms, and more. A great variety of circumstances may have led these men and women to serve, but in the end, all of them gave something up. Many gave their very lives in our defense. Still others sustained grave psychological and physical injuries. And all of them gave their time, their comfort, and their freedoms in order to safeguard ours. Each and every one of them left the relative security and predictability of their previous lives, often enduring long separations from their families, all in order to preserve and sustain the liberty we enjoy today. How do we begin to show these men and women our thanks? Thank you for your service is a good place to start, but how do we manifest that thanks? We must also honor veterans in our actions. One crucial way to do that is to attend to their and their families' needs during and after their service. Many return wounded. Many struggle with the transition back to civilian life. We must do everything in our power to assist those who have so bravely protected us. Another way to honor them is to steward the country and the ideals that they have fought and died for. It is the duty of each of us to sustain and advance the republic that we have inherited and that our veterans have preserved. Against the backdrop of the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and China's ambitions for Taiwan, debates on the United States' role in the world, how to best protect our land and its citizens, and how to best check tyranny and aggression abroad, have been rekindled with a new urgency. Whatever approach the American people and the leaders they select decide upon, our liberty and security will continue to depend upon the willingness of the many men and women in the armed forces 
to serve and to sacrifice, just as the multitude of veterans whom we celebrate today have done before them. God bless you all, and God bless our veterans. Thank you. Okay, it's now my honor to ask that the members of our audience stand or raise your hand when I call at the branch of service to be recognized for your service to our country. Would the past and present members of the United States Army stand or raise your hands? Thank you. Would the past or present members of the United States Marine Corps please stand and raise your hand? Would the past and present members of the United States Navy please stand or raise your hands? Would uh, the past and present members of the United States Air Force please stand or raise your hands? And the past and present members of this United States Space, Space Force, sorry, that's a new line there, uh, please raise your hand or stand. And with the past and present members of the United States Coast Guard, please stand or raise your hands. And lastly, would the past and present members of the United States Merchant Marines, please stand or raise your hands. Okay, and please join me in congratulating all veterans that are here today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the retiring of our colors. Okay, please be seated. One of the reasons why I volunteered to be MC today was to honor our, um, to honor the service of Sherry Kingston. She actually is a coworker of mine, um, and I've worked with her for about seven years now. Um, and I like to um, talk about her. Sharon, she's not here today. She's actually on vacation. Um, so she will have someone representing her. But Sharon, Sherry Kingston, she enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1985 and attended basic training in Fort Jackson in Columbia, South Carolina. Soon after training, she departed for Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia, and advanced individual training as a 31C single-channel operator, radio operator that included an additional Morse code course. Kingston's first duty station was the 303rd Military Intelligence Battalion, in West Fort Hood near Colleen, Texas, where from 1986 to 91, she spent most of her active duty service as she participated in the Forager 87, an annual exercise and a campaign conducted during the Cold War, whereby the forces were deployed to Europe and insisted in preparing units for deployment during the Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield. And in 1991, um, Kingston left acti active duty and joined the Army Reserves for three years as a petroleum supply specialist for the 301st MI Battalion Tactical Exploitation in Pasadena, Texas. From 1994 to 2005, Kingston was a member of the uh, Battle of the project or Projection Group for the 75th Division in Houston, Texas and the 78th Division in Fort Dix in Trenton, New Jersey as a battle simulation technician and providing realistic training for reserve and National Guard units and staff. In 2005, Kingston was called to active duty during the, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom as a 24-hour operations non-commissioned officer for the 78th Division Headquarters until January of 2007. 
She retired as a sergeant first class shortly thereafter with 21 years of service. During her time in service, she received several awards, including the Army Commendation Medal. She got two of them. Army um, Achievement Medal, her fourth award. The Army Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Service Medal, her second award. And the Global War on Terri Ter Terrorism uh, Service Medal and the Meritorious Service Medal. And in 2009, Kingston joined Rice University as a research administrator in the Wise School of Natural Sciences and is currently the school's director of research administration. Kingston credits the military for providing structure in her life and strengthening her confidence in herself. While she per participated and experienced things she would never have thought of that she would be able to accomplish, she enjoyed the diverse community and the closeness of the military family. And a quote, I deeply respect those I served with over my 21 years of service. As members of the military family, we all shared core values, goals, and experiences. And I'd like to invite Rachel Miller to the stage and present the flag and a certificate. Um, this is the conclusion of our veteran ceremony. Um, please join us for a brief reception following. Um, and in closing, if you would, um, I'd like to welcome Stephanie to the podium. And if you are a veteran and didn't receive a pen, uh, please see Josh. Josh is standing over here and he will pass one out to you. Thank you very much. beautiful for spacious skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stern impassioned stress, a thorough fear for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thy every Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful, for pure was proved in liberating strife. Who Self, the country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be. And every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that see beyond.